Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, short discussion here today, um, which is really grows out of uh, a couple of initiatives uh, organized at this year's Virgin Film Festival under the banner of Older People on Screen, um, which is done in association with uh, public health. Now, there's two parts to this initiative. There's the Screen 8, which is a, a film production workshop, and then there's an older film critics uh, section to it too. So this brief discussion really kind of frames uh, those initiatives um, with some of the participants. Um, and really, both of these initiatives feed into wider concerns, I think, in Irish and international society around uh, the theme of aging. We know that uh, Western civilization and Western societies in general are, are aging um, at a, a considerably rapid pace. Uh, society and, and the, the pyramid, if you like, of, of Western society is shifting and changing. And with that comes a number of concerns. Now, to the fore, um, if you listen to the radio or hear media, those concerns tend to be uh, represented in terms of pensions or burdens on healthcare, uh, burdens in general, and aging is generally depicted, um, albeit implicitly, in, in, in negative terms. So I believe there's a, a fair amount of work to be done there and to think about this in, in different terms. And in my work uh, in, in, in film and in film questions of film representation, I try to interrogate images of aging. Um, I'm Tony Tracy and I work at NUI Galway. So on our panel uh, today, we have uh, Professor Roger O'Sullivan, who's the director of Aging Research and Development at the Institute of Public Health. Um, we have filmmaker Paul Farn and participants uh, in his uh, Screen 8 initiative, um, PJ Brady. We have um, older critic, P, uh, part of the older critic initiative, Peter Clark and Glenda Chmino. And uh, we also have actor um, Breed Ninakin in one of the films that the critics will be watching, Rose Chagas Frank, but is uh, well known to Irish viewers uh, of all kinds of films, uh, TV and uh, indeed theatre. So I'll seek opinions from all of these uh, participants on, on their experience, both personally uh, of ageing, but also in, in various initiatives around this year's diff. So I'll begin perhaps with uh, one of the co-sponsors of this panel and the initiative, uh, which is Roger O'Sullivan from the Institute of Public Health. And I'd like to begin by asking Roger about this field. Um, what, uh, what are the key themes here uh, in, in the area of aging and aging studies? Um, and what kind of things should we be sensitive to? What have you discovered uh, over your years in, in this area? Tony, thank you very much. And I uh, really look forward to uh, talking with everybody and hearing everybody's views. Uh, so I'll start back a little, uh, just to give a little bit of context. So I'm a, the Director of Aging Research and Development in the Institute of Public Health, and I'm particularly interested in aging and older people. Um, as Tony mentioned, population aging is one of the great successes of public health. We're living longer than ever before. Uh, in the last 100 years, you can see there have been decades add, added to our life. Um, in Ireland today, uh, the average age for a man is uh, 80, and the average age for a woman is uh, 84. And one in five people by 2030 will be over the age of 65, and by uh, 2050, one in four. So the reason I give those statistics is just to remember the importance and the significance of what we're talking about. So the fact of it is, many more of us are living longer than ever before. Tony correctly touched on the issue that actually so, so often this is seen in a negative way as a burden, as a challenge for our healthcare system, as a challenge for pensions. And that's actually some of the issues, Tony, that's coming up. And there's a term ageism. Ageism is a, a term that's 50 years old. Bob Butler uh, uh, introduced us to this term in 1969. And it was this bias that's formal and informal, that's based on stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination. And we have to think about ageism just in terms of our stereotypes, our language, our representation, issues around diversity and inclusion. And that's really the themes that's gonna be covered today. So what we want to do is to, uh, that we're living longer, we want to maximize the benefits of those years. And part of that is actually challenging ageism challenging everyday ageism, the language that we have, the language that we hear from others, the language that we, that we may use ourselves. And too often the, the image and, and language is very negative or stereotypical. And it's about challenging that 
and helping people to think about aging and growing older, one of the best things in, in life, and about being able to connect a, a new vision and voice. Uh, so just before I move back to Tony, uh, if we think about ageism, we just have to make sure that people realize that aging, ageism is bad for society, it's bad for individuals. And why is that? It's because it actually makes us think about aging and growing older in a particular way. And what I expect part of the discussion is how we reframe those discussions. So Tony, I'll hand back to you now. Hopefully it right, not yeah. take too much of your time. So ageism then, uh, as you say, is a, is a term um, that's, that's already 50 years old. It's not a new term. I wonder, actually, you know, breaking with my kind of scheduling of things, what do people experience aging, ageism? Is that a term that you've kind of been drawn to 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 use in your own in your own life? Um, I noticed uh, my my mother using it recently, and I was sort of taken aback, you know, that she felt that she had been um, a victim of aging. Is, is something ageism something people have experienced or not so much? what's interesting about it is the um <clears throat> i don't i don't use the word ageism but i understand invisibility mm. i'm i'm very aware as an older person being uh, invisible in a lot of contexts whereas when we were younger uh you know we were the life and soul of our work life life and soul of our community as we get older we are we are less we appear to be less relevant and uh, one of the things that i enjoy is um making an attempt to counteract that by just inserting myself into it. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of poets that Glenda is part of who are who start the, the poet poetry group started after people retired 23 years ago and we're still going strong um, <laughs> and you know and we're actively writing and actively publishing and, and that's just one of the ways that you you know uh, that I experience how um, I deal with it, but also I'm very lucky health wise mm. uh, and many of us, I, as we get older, are just not in a physical condition to do what we used to do or even to do something for ourselves. So we're drawn into into, um, uh, you know, in, in, into the withdrawal. Yeah. Um, I loved Bree's characterization in uh, Rosha as the person in grief who disappeared into the bed and then took a shock film device to take her out of it you know that I, I thought that was a lovely way in which you know a major incident of loss can actually knock people out of place okay I'll come back to the film in, in a little bit but just if I could just keep it to that ageism thing I'm just curious really if that's something people I, I really like Peter's comment about um, visibility and invisibility maybe that's more appropriate way of thinking about it um what what do other people feel have they, have they experienced ageism or is that something that's undermines well, Glenda. I have in the sense that uh, people sometimes think that you're not capable of doing things you are capable of doing. Like yeah. you're going to go for the stairs and they sort of say, oh, well, maybe you should take the lift. <laughs> 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 and, right. um, you know, I was on my bike the other day and somebody said, can I help you? Do you need any help? And I thought, I'm just a person on my bike. What, what's going on here? <laughs> but I find in myself that um, I'm also in a bit of denial. Like my mind is still 20. My mm -hmm. body is 75. And my mind says, we're going to go on a three kilometer walk today. And my body says, no, we're not. We're going to walk to the, to the road and back. Oh, that's interesting because reality as well. And also, well, and, and also, also, I think what's what's crucial there, Glenn, is the idea of, um, you know, you know, so much of of age, if you like, is 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 internal. You know, we, we put it on, we impose it on ourselves. But in your case, it works the other way around, which I really quite I think that's the better way to be, you know, whereas we can sometimes um, self deselect um from from situations and environments but how about you pj what what uh, is ageism something you've ever thought about or come up across yeah uh, i think yeah the, it's a fascinating discussion we're having as actors and i speak for the actors and poets of the world in my world and uh, we always play ages that are way above ourselves in general i find in the last 25 years all my work are, are literary characters that are in their 60s uh, 70s. So I'm at the right age for that business now. Um, so ageism as an actor for me has always been like, okay, I'm not going to be playing 25 year olds for the next 10 years. 
uh, I was always playing older, way older, you know. So I settled into age. My my father was born in 1897. <laughs> so I can say I aged um, alongside my father as, as a very young boy. I could see ageism. I could see ageism in the unit of family because uh, it was in foster home as well. So I could see ageism having its place, whereas today it's kind of lost its place, you know, because you never see a full defined family of ages anymore, you know. Uh -huh. It's rare to see that in society today in Ireland and across the world, really. And although other countries have it, but we don't we don't have it. The age, the respect and the, the place of the elderly is changed in Ireland and lots of other countries. But there are some countries like um, in, in, in Asia and places like that, you know, everyone has a place in a family, you know. Whereas yeah. I think we have no, no, that's very it's really interesting. That kind of notion of intergenerational relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, that's partly because of the way, you know, our families have split up, they've gone to live in different parts of the world, or in my yeah. own case, different parts of the country, and, and you mm. don't have that three or four generations of people in, in and common. And it's a great loss, you know, to children yeah. not knowing the, the ageism, sageism, you know, I call ageism, it ageism, sageism, sageism, I like that, you know. know. The kids will say, oh, granddad does this and, you know, daddy's all wrong, but granddad has a sus and grandma has a sus, but daddy and mammy's not really with it, you know. <laughs> children never get that opportunity nowadays, whereas when we were children growing up, we said, well, if your father doesn't know, your grandfather could know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Very uh, good. So that's, that's totally moved the goalpost as such, yeah. That's great. And I'll come back to you, PJ, in a minute, because you have obviously enormous wisdom and um, mm -hmm. uh, experience there, which I'd love to talk a little bit uh, about more. And I'll talk to Breed in specific terms about ageism, maybe in a little while about in her, in her career, because I, you, you've introduced that theme of acting age, which I, I find very, very interesting. Let's move, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, into sort of some structured elements um, before I come back to each of you. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this Screen Age initiative. Now, as I understand it, DIFF, uh, the Dublin International Film Festival in previous years, has tried to bring um, groups of uh, younger uh, people together to make films. And this year moved towards um, uh, uh, gathering a group of older young filmmakers, as, as we might say. So perhaps uh, that this has been facilitated by Paul Farron. Um, Paul, you might just uh, give us a little bit of background to this and tell us how, how you went about it. Well, I got the call through uh, an application from DIFF and Digital Hub. I said, I'd love to do this. I got a history of making films with groups in the community of all ages. And I kind of like that method of talent, of teaching as well as making stuff. So I said, just meet the guys on their own level and see what we have and see what we can do. And I met an amazing bunch of people. And in 12 weeks, we put together, I think, a pretty solid short. See, PJ's have to fall over. <laughs> PJ's run away now and I need him. But yes, yeah, so it was really a case of meeting two groups from the community. Um, one was already with Digital Hub. And then there was a men's shed up in Dolphins Burn. And... Uh, the guys had already approached them about being the interested group. Then they asked me would I be interested in working with the guys and making that happen. And, and we did, despite COVID and winter, we worked out a system and a way. And we've, I'm in the middle of the sound mix at the moment and the colour grade. And we have a cast and crew on Monday. Great. Um, so, Paul, tell me how you uh, figured out what you would make your story about. What, how we, what would be the theme and topic of, this, of the film? I suppose we eased in with looking at it, what people knew. Um, we kept it practical in terms of making things and talking about uh, films that people liked and finding out who did want to do what. It's always the case. So you want to be in front of the camera. I was lucky I had a, a ton of actors. I think everybody ended up in front of the camera at some point or another. And the team itself came from just them talking from their own point of view. And eventually we had two ideas came along from two people which were about people of their age. One was set in a waiting room in the doctors and the other one was about, um, which is a lovely idea as well, was about a man trying to get out and about after becoming a widower and go dancing again just to socialise. And through both of them, they inspired me to go away and write a script for the guys based around the waiting room team, because again, we had to be practical. 
there was the worry of COVID and winter, and we knew we had a nice interior location. And also, we had to be honest that, you know, two days is a long time, you know. And, and it became this kind of thing, just organic. I can't even explain some of how the magic came along, but it was just one of those things. And the guys brought all these wonderful characters. I mean, PJ, how would you describe your character in Waiting? Oh, yeah, I thought you're right, Paul. It was an organic experience for us all. And um, because I work in the communities, I got to know all those characters that you put on screen. So um, my character is a guy who basically is one of the great waiters. You know, he waits everywhere <laughs> and he enjoys helping out other people. And he's totally involved in, in literature. So he, he's in his mind all the time. But he's, he's outside himself when he wants to help people and support people. And he, he's very tuned in to his, his community, you know? So he's a very benevolent character, yeah. So we kind of said it in what was a stereotypical environment, you know, people going to the doctor, but that's not what it's about. As I said, we, we don't want to give the, way, the ending away, PJ, but there's more going on. It was about those conversations that people have, but about the humanity of people, you know, that just happen to be a little bit older than other people. They still have as much to say and as much life as anybody else. And as... Has blended the book very well, you know. Being 20 can last an awful long time. I, I came across a wonderful piece with Patrick McGoon talking about young energy, and he was talking about people in their 70s and their 80s and how that they had this fire in the belly. And I, I, I you also you mentioned earlier about people flatlining and getting older. I always remember guys in school that seemed to be dying from middle age, 19, and they hit that middle age very fast because they didn't have it here. And this is, again, one of those things that we need to defy with this conversation about ageism and the stereotypes you mentioned, you know. So I suppose that's what we were at in our quiet way. We didn't want to be dramatic and we didn't want to create a melodrama. So we have a few little incidents in it. You know, it's mostly about people having chats. There's one incident in the middle about someone who is at a point of possibly dementia and how everybody deals with that. And that's that's we, you know, we don't want to poke the subject really hard. Because I'm aware of it myself. My own mum is in a nursing home at the moment and she's on that on the early stage of that. So that was in my head at the, back, at the back of my head when we were writing it as well, you see. So we touched on the subjects, but remained, you know, stoic in the way we talked about them, I suppose. Would that be a good way of putting it, PJ? Yeah, I think so. I think that the, the actual fact that everyone at a certain age ends up waiting for something um to quote um the great uh, russian writers you know we're all waiting for something better um <laughs> maxim gorky i think he said that uh, right. a long time ago and uh, in waiting uh, everybody connects again you know and especially with the pandemic we've been waiting for three years to get back at work you know so we have a perfect title in the world when waiting at the moment yeah, and, and hopefully Paul has done everything to, to bring us all together in that moment, you know, which was a great experience, I have to say, Paul, for us all, because uh, all my yeah, friends me too. <laughs> local community have, have been on high ever since, you know. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you've really done a, a great job there in explaining, um, you know, both the tone and the approach and also the theme. Uh, uh, brilliant, PJ, the idea of the theme being so uh, opposite and, um, uh, and and topical. And also I, I was struck there, Paul, by your mention of um, of dementia, which is coming to the fore more and more in films. Um, it's not something mm. I've personal experience of but I do kind of worry sometimes that it's become a kind of fashionable theme you know um, and, and in some portraits that I've seen which I, I probably shouldn't name you know that it becomes a kind of melodramatic device in fact um, rather than a kind of respectful you know uh, uh, thematic uh, treatment because there's, there's a lot of films uh, that follow this theme now but as you said you 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 know, you, you didn't poke at it. You didn't sort of push it too far. You simply sort of uh, admitted it into the room or into the conversation. Yeah, I mean, we purposely never mentioned the word for a start. Yeah. You know, um, it's as much about people outside of the circumstance dealing with what they're seeing, as yeah. we all do. You know, when you meet that kind of either a small child or someone who's a bit off to the left, yeah. we try and normalize very quickly and for a long time. So it's, it's Can I just hard the, yeah. the part, part of it for people, you know. Yeah, great. Can I just ask you very quickly, um, Paul, about working with a group of older actors and a, a little bit about the energy in the room there, about how that worked and anything distinctive about that? Well, as I said, 
I, I just feel like they were a fantastic group. I mean, PJ comes with loads of experience, by the way. I don't know if he's boasted about this. He probably hasn't, but he's got a lot of experience. PJ's in, in uh, the Playboys, and uh, he's got all sorts of roles going back. And so it was nice knowing he was in the room. He's got his theatre background on Bell booked in the 80s and that. So he was there. Then people came along with this fantastic energy and desire to be in it. Mm-hmm. And Anne, who unfortunately can't make it, who played our, our kind of pivotal character, the dementia character, she was fantastic. And uh, mm-hmm. she said that she was after the first day when we all gelled and we, we just talked about movies that day, didn't we, PJ? And everyone talked yeah, about their favorite films. And I showed them a, yeah. mm-hmm. and I showed them a documentary I made about my father who was dead and he used to be a fisherman and I made a small documentary. I actually didn't show them a drama film. I showed them a documentary because I was trying to show what kind of heart and soul of making the film, where it came from me personally. I don't like showing my own stuff. I think it's better always to show other stuff normally, but it seemed to be suit the occasion, didn't it, PJ? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that kind of got everyone on board. And yeah. People just sit, even the ones that didn't hang around forever, they came across because they enjoyed watching everybody else. Because yeah. we, we got into exercises very quickly. And as I said, we only had to watch our energy. I mean, we were all worn out after two days. I think I was talking to the crew after the, we did a, a Friday, Saturday shoot. That was like 10 hours each day. Everyone was, mm. but the, the madness of making a film, I think everyone took to and loved. Right. So I warned them from the start. I said, if we're making a film, you're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting. I don't know, waiting and waiting and waiting, and then you'll do something. <laughs> Um, uh, can, can, Paul, can I just ask you before I let you go? You did mention to me that you you got a very fancy score composed for your film. Yes, um, uh, one of my associates, Brian Keegan, who also was our sound recordist, is a wonderful composer. I've been working with him on and off for a few years now, and he did a beautiful. See, there's a dance sequence in the middle of our film, believe it or not, even though we're in a waiting room, and uh, he be- did this beautiful waltz. We knew, it was a wall. we knew there was a waltz in there, didn't we, PJ? We said that the dream sequence is kind of, I, I think you'll be love it when you see it. This little dream sequence in it with a waltz. And uh, music. Yeah. he did an amazing piece of music. I, 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 I don't like using steel music from YouTube unless it's for some silly corporate. But for this, it deserved, it, it was nice for the guys to have that because they danced to it. And we, we, play, we played the music live on the set for this right. really fast scene we did to try and gather up about a two minute sequence of dancing, you know, super. OK, and just to remind people that that uh, film is screening on uh, February 25th at one o'clock mm-hmm. at the Lighthouse uh, Cinema. Um, I might just move to the other initiative, which was about film critics um, who will watch some films and, and um, take some perspectives uh, during uh, during the festival. Um, Glenda, you've got a good cinematic surname there, um, the great Michael Cimino, of course. Um, do you watch films? Do you enjoy films? And, and um, you know, if so, do you, you know, do you have a particular type of film that you really enjoy? Well, not only do I watch films, I also make films. Ah, oh, wow. Made okay. a, a nine minute short called Bog Meditation. Nobody wanted to screen in Ireland. It was about four older artists learning how to sculpt with bog mud. And it won a prize in Hollywood. So Uh, there. (laughs) But yes, um, I like all kinds of films. Like I've been kind of, in my older years, I've been an Agatha Christie fan. I've gone to the festivals and seen all of the um, Poirot and um, Miss Marple things and done interesting research on who the actors were and what their other lives were like. So um, I sort of study film. And first, before I made a film, I watched Citizen Kane 25 times because I was terrified of making a film, but I couldn't get anyone else to make my script. So I watched it for, you know, cinematography. I watched it for symbolism. I watched it for camera angles. I watched it for dialogue. It was a great process. And he was 25 when he made that, you know? Yeah, great. Um, uh, Glenda, I, there's so much I could ask you about, but one thing I, uh, which is just germane perhaps to this conversation is, um, what what's your view of uh, constructions or representations of older uh, people in, in films? Do you have a view on that? Or is there any, you know, it, it, are people stereotyped? Are they pushed to the side? Is there enough representation? I think there is a lot of stereotyping. Mm-hmm. Um, I know PJ from years ago. We were in ah. films together. Yes. But um, mm-hmm. I got, a, yeah, I um, got offered an extras role in a wheelchair. I suppose the next thing they'll offer me is a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite, my favorite depiction of old age in film would have to be the best exotic Marigold Hotel. 
Yeah, or you have cool. a group of people, they're all older, they're all very different, they all have different motives, they have in common that they're older, and they're looking for a place they can live out their lives and still have adventures. And um, it's just a marvelous film. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people are depicted in ways which are stereotypical. And as you say, there's been a big rush, like with the whole diversity thing, to depict dementia and Alzheimer's and you know, people like Iris Murdoch, the film about her was was actually very good. Mm. But there's like a plethora of these. It's like zombie films. Everybody's making them now. <laughs> That's an interesting comparison. Now. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it becomes the way we talk about older age. You know, it's the only way we can talk about older age through this melodramatic kind of uh, um, sense of diminishment. And as as uh, one gerontologist calls it, the narrative of decline, the inevitable narrative of decline. Um, rather than um, what one another gerontologist talks about is he talks about the aging dividend. I, I really like this expression, the aging dividend, the idea that aging brings something extra to it rather than takes uh, subtracts um, um, from it. Um, uh, Peter, you're you're looking forward to maybe this role as well. Is this something that you, you do regularly? You go to cinema, you critique, you think about these uh, ideas of, of how aging is represented? No, I just disappear into the film. Ah. <laughs> my, my mother brought me to my first film, I think, at the age of five, and I became infatuated. Really? And all of my life, I would, and it, it was the most wonderful escape. Uh, I would, you, you know, you would, I would go to a cinema on my own at around the age of eight or nine, disappear into one and wouldn't talk to anybody for about three hours afterwards. I can remember go, going to see um, a film, a French film called A Man and a Woman with a pal of mine. And uh, I was totally enraptured by it. And I couldn't talk to him after we left. And he didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. But I just, I, I, I go into it and it's very hard to come back out again. It yeah. takes ages. And that's what cinema does for me. It's, um, it captures things. I, I, I'm kind of interested in the conversation about um, how older people are represented and the dementia. My mother uh, had dementia, so we managed her uh, for about two and a half years before she died. I say very facetiously, listen, we've only three jobs to do in the world. Get into it, get our parents off it, and get ourselves off it. Mm. They're the three core thing, and everything else is a bonus in between. You know, mm. so, um, and I think, I think um, the older people, the, it, it is dramatic. If you're in it, it is very dramatic. And mm. the weight and strain of having to manage somebody with it is huge. So how it's depicted in the cinema is quite interesting. I think Anthony Hopkins did a wonderful job of, of mm. his role. Uh, and I, I know everyone gets onto a bandwagon, but it doesn't. And the other thing I have a thing about stereotype, stereotype tip, stereotyping is based in truth. It's mm. an exaggerated, uh, a uh, repetitive version of what really happens, yeah. and then it, it and it becomes a shorthand. But it, it like it it it's not it's not a lie. It's based in actuality. You know, so mm -hmm. we just have to manage that it doesn't make us rigid in our thinking about things. Um, and Peter, would you would you go to the movies often? Uh, not recently um mm. uh, covid locked us down a, a bit but yes I, I did i go to france a lot I, I, down in the south of france they the uh, the little village that i go to has a cinema that that the local uh, 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 council own and run mm. so um and they have um uh, i don't speak french so i go to whenever they have a vo film in it we go to it and it's yeah. very funny to be sitting there with about six other people yeah. But we've seen a lot of brilliant films down there in yeah. this very cozy little cinema. Yeah. Uh, and I, so, yes, it's still a huge art, an, an art form that I hugely enjoy. I wonder, um, I, actually, I've just, I'm kind of interested. So does the IFI have this small initiative called um, Wild Strawberries, uh, where they yes. have cinema for all. And I, I sort of, I, I wonder about the idea of creating cinema clubs for older audiences. Um, what, what do you, do you have a view on that? Or a, a couple of things. They do it in the morning. Yeah. Very civilized time for older people. Most yeah. people, older people want to be going to bed at eight o'clock at night. We don't have the energy to be staying up half the night <laughs> or, or going out, do you know? Uh, and there's a kind of a nervousness as we get older about going out, uh, yeah. partic particularly in Dublin. So on the one hand, I, I, I haven't been to any, but I know people who do and they love it. And it becomes like a social club. Do you know, yeah. I, I, Glenda, I don't know. Have you been to any of them? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I used to go to them regularly, and they were always packed. Like, they'd be in the large cinema one, and it would be full of people. Yeah. And sometimes there'd be people there that I knew would have a coffee with afterwards. It was a lovely social occasion. And yeah. the films were all selected, and they were introduced with interesting little bits of background yeah. by the IFI staff. So I, I think it was a very good initiative. And for a while, they were free just to get people in. And then they went up to, like, a, a very, very low price, which included a cup of coffee. Who could ask for more? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to say, uh, to my surprise, I went with my parents there uh, after lockdown. And I'm now of an age where I qualify to go in. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Which was a rather rude surprise, I have to admit. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll turn to you, Breach, if you, if you don't mind. It's it's great to have you on the call. Uh, I, I I know you from all kinds of places and, and spaces, and um, you're here in in a number of capacities, but perhaps primarily because one of your films uh, is part of the critics. Uh, uh, palette or, or menu, if you like, which is called Rosha and Frank. You might just tell us a little bit about that film um, before I ask you some more general questions. Well, um, Rosha and Frank, it's about this woman who had has lost her husband, uh, the husband who was very much a pillar of, of the GAA in their community. And I suppose the film starts with, there was the world before and the world after, and it starts with the world after Frank's. And she's, we talk about lockdown and stuff, and she's locked down in herself, in her grief, in her loneliness. And, um, and she, it, it's, it, it's interesting. When I read the script first, I thought, Oh, she she's no women friends. She she doesn't seem to have any women friends. She's kind of locked herself in, really, and um, and uh, and all that grief, as I said, it, it it comes in waves, and she she it takes something, um, obviously the dog to to sort of get her out of all of that, and. Uh, at first, you know, we were saying earlier, you know, you don't work with children or animals. And, oh, you know, when I read the script first, I thought, oh, OK, um, this um, animal is going to be practically in every shot. So how do I deal with that? But it was it, it was very challenging and it was very enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a really lovely film. It seems silly uh, at first, you know. Mm, it, 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 yeah. But the silliness gives way to real, yeah. real truth and real profundity, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it becomes quite moving, actually, uh, the deeper in it goes. Oh, good, uh, good, yeah. Yeah, and, and the that, other thing I should say about it, just uh, kind of in a more a more general way, it looks beautiful. It's in, it's in a part of Ireland that is rarely seen. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in, it, we, we shot it in, in Rhine in Waterford, and it was absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, you, you might be you might as well be in a French uh, sort of film. It's, it's gloriously sunny and coastal and so on and so forth. And um, what about um, that notion? Well, there's a lot we could say, but we've got very little limited amount of time. There's a sort of a cliche, if you don't mind me putting it to you, which is about um, jobs for older actors. Uh, that is to say, characters uh, and stories for older actors. And and then on top of that, there's often a point made about jobs characters for older actors who are women. Um, yeah. Is that something that you believe, agree with or is that is that become just sort of a, a cliche? No, I don't think it's a cliche. I think it's harder for us as women. Uh, uh, I, I've been very lucky, uh, PJ touched on it. I was playing older uh, yes. in, I played a 70 year old when I was heavily pregnant, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so. I've always been play, uh, playing older, um, partly in theatre, and I've always found that really challenging because older people have lived their lives. Older women, we're wiser, you mm. know, we've lived our lives. We're, it, it, they're more challenging, there are more challenging roles. But I, I definitely agree that I think there's a, a slow sea change happening now with older women on screen. We see, you know, we see the Glenn Close, we see Leslie Manville, we see Judy Dench, we see all of these uh, actors playing wonderful, um, meaty roles. Wow. But I think until we have more 
screenwriters, uh, uh, more with women really as screenwriters and more producers and more uh, directors. Um, I think uh, that that sea change is will be is slow is slow. Mm -hmm. that's, how, yeah. that's what I find it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Breach. And I suppose the other thing I'm sort of interested in is I know that that character in Crane the Killer, you played a number mm -hmm. of times at yeah. different ages and so yeah. on. I was just curious about how your approach to a character, you know, and actually the same character might have changed. Did you notice yourself play that character differently as you, as you aged yourself? Well, I look back on that uh, that particular character now, and I think I would have played her differently because you, as I said, you've more of a life experience as you get older. Um, but I, 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 I suppose how I how I um, come to 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 uh, play a character, you get the script, you're telling a story, so I try uh, as much as possible to. Um, uh, I suppose to, to trust the writer, to trust mm -hmm. the director. I, I don't, I come with a blank canvas. Some yeah. actors come and they've already made up their minds as to how they're going with the character. I come with a blank canvas mm -hmm. and I, I, I trust the writer, as I said, and I trust the director. And well, I try I to serve the writer. As I say, I think you do a great job in this film, um, which uh, is, is, is lovely to look at and uh, deals with a very important theme, a widowhood, um, yeah. and widowerhood and uh, mm -hmm. the, the death of a partner, a theme that I think is often underestimated in our mm -hmm. society. But, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For those of us who uh, have been touched by it or know people mm -hmm. who have been touched by mm -hmm. it, we know, mm -hmm. we know it's a really, really important um, mm -hmm. issue of, uh, of, of continuing on, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's that continuing on. And it's it's a relationship with the son as well. Yeah. You know, that had been fractured. And we don't know because we've come to the world after. But how he felt, how he was, because uh, I, 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 in my head, uh, Rosha and Frank were very much a couple. And the son was, you know, on the outside in a uh -huh. way. So as a result of her coming out of that grief, she has, she has the, the relationship between herself and the son is warmer again and, and, and through the grandchild and stuff. And she sees that. Yeah, very good. Anyway, I, I strongly recommend it. It's got a, it's got a lot to recommend and, and would work well, I think, with, um, with, with lots of audiences. So I'm going to have to wrap up there. But Roger, um, what, what do you think about what you just heard there? What a rich panel. I wish I was here for a couple of hours. You know. and what, what struck you as a researcher in the field uh, of ageing and, and social gerontology? Well, um... I just want to thank everybody for the great contributions I really enjoyed and you know, we started off talking about rather than the term ages and being invisible. I thought that was a really nice way. Um, but some of the themes that have come out around the importance of knowledge and value in knowledge, place and family and society in work in the cinema. Uh, I thought it was really interesting about that issue about playing roles much older than you were actually at the time and aging in those roles. Mm. Um, the issue about intergenerational opportunities and I actually thought about wild strawberries. Um, there's maybe you know an intergenerational opportunity or even on screen eight to actually bring younger people and older people together to make the film, but it's actually the conversation that they actually have about the film. Because there's a phrase that I just keep on thinking about here. What we see is what we can be. And if you think about how older people, how women, how older women, how older men, how people are portrayed in society is, is in many ways, it sets your framework about what you can be. And I think that's really, really important. Now, I do talk about challenging some of the, the language, but challenge can be a nice thing and it can be an enjoyable thing. So uh, a friend of mine was a, a lecturer uh, in social work and she asked her student three questions and so you may want to ask people these questions in your world what's your perception of older people and then the second question after you hear that is what's your experience of older people 
And for younger people or people of any age, what type of older person will you be? Mm. Mm. That's really terrific, Roger. Um, I, I love that. I love that. That's a terrific way of, of ending. And uh, it reminds me of my own uh, uh, recognition that um, aging doesn't happen to other people. It happens to all of us, <laughs> um, where there's a, there's a sort of perception that uh, other people are old, but I'm just I'm just staying still in a sense. What kind of person will you be? And um, this has been a really great conversation. Thank you to Diff for affording us the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, and thank you to Roger O'Sullivan. Thank you to Paul Farron and PJ Brady. And thank you to Glenda Chimino and Peter Clark. And thank you very much to Breed Enochton. Uh, I'm Tony Tracy, and uh, I hope uh, we get to see some of you at the uh, event at DIFF, uh, which, as I say, takes place on Friday, February 25th. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>